let's uh, talk about the certificate for just a few minutes. I know you signed up for this webinar on tools for oral proficiency. And the tools that you're going to hear about today are tools that uh, we use, almost all of them, uh, quite frequently in the various assignments and projects that we do in the certificate courses. Um, so my name is Edwige Simon, and I'm the director of the certificate program. I'm also uh, one of the two people who designed the curriculum uh, and think about creating a program like this one. You're probably aware that there are very few programs like this one out there. Um, and we have been around for now four years. So it is our four year, fourth year. Uh, it is a great time to join the program because it is growing. And uh, when uh, Amanda, for example, joined the program, there were only six or seven students per class. But now, as you guys have noticed, Heidi and Stephen, we're getting up to 14 and 16, and I think it's going to continue to go up. So right now is a good time to um, join the program while it's still small. Um, <clears throat> it is offered by the Division of Continuing Education at the University of Colorado Boulder. It's a 12 credit program, but it's also a very flexible program. So for example, if you just want to take one course, you register and you take one course. Um, that's totally fine. If you end up taking 12 credits and the requirements, you will find yourself with a graduate certificate. And that happens a lot. Um, it is a fully online program. And uh, the focus of the program is language teaching with technology. We talk a lot about technology, but we talk a lot about language teaching in general. Uh, it is a good fit for language uh, educators uh, in the US and beyond. And in language educators, I include TESOL teachers. Uh, we, over the years, have quite a few um, English teachers. Actually, Stephen is an uh, English te teacher. The cost of the program is $495 per credit hours. And I know you probably have questions about financial aid, and we don't have scholarships at this point. Um, what else can I tell you about the program? Um, well, you, you might be interested in, or you might wonder why you would invest time and money in a program like the certificate. Um, I start with meet language educators from all over the world because this seems to be the biggest perk of the program. I'd like to think that my courses are outstanding, but when I ask my students what they liked best about the program, they really enjoyed meeting um, teachers, French, Spanish, English teachers from uh, the US, but also the world in general. And so it's a really great way to expand your professional network. Um, the courses are small. Um, you can expect to see really 12 to, we've never had 18 students, but yeah, it might happen. Um, but the courses are pretty small and they're all organized uh, in the same way. So once you've taken one course, you know what to expect in the other courses. Um, there is always one theme per week and two deadlines per week. And if you wonder what you would be doing, well, you would be reading articles and blog posts and you'd be watching videos and discussing this material, brainstorming lesson plans, working on personal projects, completing guided explorations. Um, you'd be interviewing experts. Um, and so it's a really practical program. Everything you do in the program is meant to be used and implemented in your classroom um, the next day. So um, I will finish this brief overview of the program with an overview of um, the next course. This is the next course. Uh, it's, uh, it's called Emerging Tools in Practice. Um, I used to offer a course called uh, Tools in Practice about tools that are used routinely by teachers in their classroom. And then I realized that one course was not enough. And so I ended up creating a fall version of this course where we look at mainstream technologies and tools that teachers use regularly um, and reading the research about them and, and looking at what teachers are doing. But this particular course is focused on emerging tools. And so we're looking at augmented reality and virtual reality. Heidi actually took that course last year. Um, actually, we have more than one student who took that course last year. Um, and, um, sorry, somebody's drawing on the slides. <laughs> um, and so it's a course dedicated to, uh, um, emerging technologies. And so there is no technology integration project in this course. There is usually one in all of my courses, but in this one, there's what I call a technology exploration project, uh, where you, um, 
you basically pick a theme and then you complete the guided exploration of your topic. You become the expert on your topic over the course of eight weeks. But in addition to that, every week we look at a different topic. Um, so that's Emerging Tools. It's eight weeks. It starts at the end of next week. There is still room in the course, but I think enrollment is going to pick up because I'm, I just sent an email today saying there is one week left to register for this course. If you're interested in the program, this is one of the two requirements. So if you take this course, you're done with one of the two requirements and the other one is only offered in the summer. The next course is a really unique course uh, on uh, teacher proficiency. And this course is for teachers who need to work on their own proficiency. Um, you might be teaching French or Spanish, but you might not have a chance to practice your French and Spanish outside of your classroom. You might not be in a position to travel. There are many, many reasons why you might want to work on your proficiency as your New Year's resolution. Uh, and so this course pairs you with a language partner with whom you meet one-on-one -on -one every other week. And then as a part of the course, you discuss issues pertaining to proficiency with the other teachers around some short readings. So it's a one credit hour course and it starts in February. And then later this spring, we have a course on telecollaboration, which is how to pair your students with students abroad. What kind of tasks you can do? Where can you find those students? And I teach the other two courses that I just mentioned, but I don't teach this one. This one is usually taught by Carolyn Fuchs, who is an ESL professor um, in Boston. Uh, if you guys took a course with Carolyn, she moved back from Hong Kong. She's back in the US permanently. So um, let's see. Um, so one more thing. Uh, students often assume that they have to go through a lengthy application process to start taking courses. They, you don't. Basically, it's a three-step process. You apply for a student ID number. You use your student ID to activate your CU credential. You're going to receive a username and a password, and then you register for courses. And that's because a certificate is not technically a degree, it's a credential. So I don't have to see your transcripts or three letters of recommendation or whatnot. If it were a master's program, it would be different, but it's not. It's a certificate program. Um, and that's all I have. Um, I think for the sake of time, I'm just going to let Megan, Megan, let me find you in my list so that I can unmute you. And um, sorry, there we go. I'm finding you. It's because you went by M M. There you are. Sorry about that. That's okay. Uh Hello to everyone out there. Uh, my name is Megan McNichol, and I am a Spanish teacher at Hershey High School in the Dairy Township School District in Hershey, Pennsylvania. And yes, we are the Hershey from the chocolate. We are Chocolate Town, USA. Um, this is my 13th year in the classroom as an educator, and I wanted to share uh, with everyone tonight about a tool that I started using last year, and that is Flipgrid. And Flipgrid is one of my favorite things to use for speaking with my students, and one of the most awesome things about it is that it's totally free. So on the next slide, it mentions a little bit about, well, what is Flipgrid? It's a tool for collecting student speaking samples. And it's all done in an a safe environment where students can have their voice heard. Uh, Flipgrid is available both as a web tool and as a app. And it consists of grids and topics. When you create your Flipgrid account, um, I mentioned earlier that it's a safe place. You're able to create uh, private grids that the students can log in with their school email uh, domains and credentials that they'll only be able to have access to it. If you want to do something more public, there is that option as well. And within the program, if you look at the screenshot to the right the, at the top, uh, that is my grid for one of my Spanish 4 classes. The grid in Flipgrid is similar to, similar to your class. And within um, the Flipgrid program, you can create as many grids as you would like. For example, I usually do one for each of my sections of my Spanish courses. Um, and then if I'm teaching multiples, for example, Spanish one classes, I might have a grid where they're all combined so they can interact with students that aren't in their uh, regular Spanish one class. Uh, within each grid, then you can create topics. And topics are uh, Flipgrid's equivalent of your prompt or discussion starter. And you can create as many topics as you want. And 
uh, in the topic, there's both an audio, audio and visual component that the students complete. They complete as video of themselves speaking to answer the question. And they can not only post their initial response to the prompt, but they, you can also create interpersonal tasks by requiring students to go in and respond to their peers. If you look at the second screenshot to the right at the bottom of the screen, that gives you a little bit of an idea as to what you'll see when students turn in their responses. The larger circle represents the student's initial response and then um, any of their peers that respond, their smaller circles that are highlighted and indented under. And that's one of the things I love about Flipgrid and its functionality. All the students' responses are stored in one place. So when you go to listen to what your students have to say, it is really easy to find everything that they have to say. One of the students' favorite features of uh, Flipgrid is when they do go to submit their final responses, they get to take a selfie. And uh, there's all kinds of stickers that they get to use with their selfie. And and that's something I know they always look forward to. Uh, when you do create your various topics or your prompts within Flipgrid, you do have the option to just post a question. However, you can also link other tools to help the students with their response. For example, if there's an article that you'd like students to read and reference in their response, you can put a link to that in the topic. Or if there's a video you'd like them to watch, you can link that to the topic uh, as well. There's an, also when you create your various topics in Flipgrid, there is the option to create uh, for feedback. And when you create feedback, there is already a rubric that Flipgrid has designed within its program um, that focuses on performance and then the students' ideas. Uh, there is a small amount of customization available with that. However, most of the time when I give students feedback, I've created rubrics that I use outside the of the program that I uh, write my feedback on and then give to the students uh, in class. With feedback, there are options that you can make it private that just the student will see it, or if it's something general you want to share with the whole class, uh, you have that option as well. Uh, the next slide explains a little bit about how I have used uh, Flipgrid in my class. It is an asynchronous tool, which means that students aren't interacting and speaking one-on-one. -on -one. They post their initial response and then um, can go back to respond to peers later. Um, one of, some of the first uses that I've uh, used started when I started last year to use Flipgrid in my classroom was for just general speaking. Uh, assignments. The two student examples I have provided there, the first one is an example of a general speaking assignment that I've done with my Spanish 4 students. In one unit in Spanish 4, we're reviewing family vocabulary and getting ready to uh, review comparison expressions. So I have the students answer a quick, a quick little prompt where um, right after reading an article about the a traditional modern family in Spain, the students um, quick answer question where they compare their own family to uh, the Spanish families mentioned in the article. Uh, and we sh I don't know if we have time for the student examples if you wanted to play the first one. Yo tengo dos hermanos y una hermana. En mi opinión, yo tengo la de una familia en la so that just gives you a short example of something that you could do. Um, uh, the second student example is another general speaking assignment that I've done with my uh, Spanish 3 students. At the beginning of the year in Spanish 3, we review the two past tenses in Spanish. And in this example, the young man is responding to a prompt uh, to explain what he was like when he was a child. Como era un niño, yo era cómico. Yo vivía en Hershey. Yo jugaba con Legos. Mi programa de televisión favorito era SpongeBob y me gustaba el spaghetti. <laughs> I think he still might like SpongeBob because that comes up in class. <laughs> Uh, also, as well, I've done interpersonal speaking tasks, and most of my interpersonal speaking tasks have been conducted more in my Spanish 4 courses. Uh, for example, two that we've done already this year, uh, we review daily routines. I put up a topic for the students, well, what's your schedule look like on a Monday? What's a typical Monday like for you? 
the students post their initial response and then they're able to go in and listen to their peers and respond and say, oh, your schedule's similar or different uh, to what I usually do on a Monday. Uh, another one interpersonal task that we've done this year in my Spanish 4 class, uh, we talk a lot about technology at the beginning of the year. And uh, this is personally one of my favorite topics that we do. I post uh, the question, if it's an advantage or disadvantage to have your cell phone in class. And it's always interesting to see the students' responses. Um, and then they're able to go in and say if they agree or disagree with their peers' opinions. My colleagues and I at Hershey have also used Flipgrid for speaking assessments. Uh, this is something we're just getting into using. Um, an example of how we used it for an assessment is, again, in my Spanish 4 class, we review large numbers because for some reason my students seem to struggle with saying any number above 15 or, or so. And when we come across numbers in reading or years, um, they struggle with it. So in Spanish 4, we make a point to review it. And for their speaking assessment, they get a card. And on the card, it says that their bank account has been compromised. And they have to go to Flipgrid and respond to the prompt. They have to say their bank account number, the date, um, their birth date, and then the dates of the last five deposits into their bank account to get them using uh, numbers in a real world task. Um, my colleagues and I at Hershey, as well as our administration, we have used Flipgrid for professional development as a staff. Um, the administrators have used it as a way to gather feedback from us as a staff. We recently, last year, implemented a one-to-one -one iPad initiative, and they had us complete a Flipgrid last year to share our successes and challenges with using it in the class. Um, we've also implemented blended learning at our school, and we just recently completed a Flipgrid where we had students um, respond to a prompt about how um, blended learning has impacted their studies at the school, as well as the um, use of iPads. And finally, this year, I started to use it when I have students that are absent from class for class discussions. Um, if there was a big speaking assignment we've been doing in class, I might, I'll post the prompt on Flipgrid and then students in their free time are able to go and respond. So they're still getting the opportunity to engage with material that they missed in class that day. In terms of some of the pros and cons of Flipgrid, one of the biggest pros is that it's completely free. All the uh, t tools and functionalities within Flipgrid are free. And this has, again, only been since the summer of 2018. There was a fee before, but now it is totally free. Um, it works on any device. Students are able to access it on their cell phones, laptops, um, iPads, or uh, if they or other tablets that they have access to it. For some reason, my students still prefer to use their cell phones instead of their uh, iPads to complete their assignments. Student engagement. I've really seen it make the students excited about um, speaking and have the opportunity to have their voice heard. They like to hear their ideas of their, their peers and be able to respond to them. Uh, the students as well, there is the option within Flipgrid that um, students are able to pause the uh, video and gather their thoughts. And there are some tools like a digital sticky note that the students can report, uh, record notes to help prompt their discussion. Um, and in terms of student engagement, I've also seen it decrease speaking anxiety among students. Some students are, uh, I have large classes. My Spanish 4 classes are uh, 29 students each. And um, in that class, it can be anxiety producing to have your voice heard. And some students that might not speak up in class are more willing to say something in the virtual in my environment on uh, flip in Flipgrid. And the students do still have the opportunity to speak face-to-face -face in the classroom. It's just that Flipgrid provides them another tool, an additional way to practice. There's also an option within Flipgrid to moderate the tasks that the students complete. So for example, if you post a topic and you don't want the students to see all of their peers' responses right away, you can set that up with the moderation um, options when you establish the topic, which allows you to go in, listen to the students' results, and then maybe share out exemplars um, for the students to respond to. Also, the staff at Flipgrid is incredible and they are always improving the functionality of the tool. They're very quick to respond to any questions or concerns that teachers email them. They're open to hearing educators and what they have to say and they're constantly making updates. 
Um, when really, I struggled with coming up with some cons for Flipgrid, and I had to ask some of my colleagues last week, I said, what don't we like about Flipgrid? Um, we currently at our school, our LMS, our learning management system is Canvas, and there is a option to integrate uh, Flipgrid right into Canvas. We haven't experienced much uh, success with that, so that's something that um, has been uh, difficult in the past. Also, too, sometimes the communication between the with the app can be difficult. Sometimes if the students are working in the app, it'll tell them to go to the website, and that can cause some confusion for the students. Also, too, as I said, they're always improving. That means they're always updating the apps. And um, my students aren't always the best troubleshooters. And if they go to use the app and it's not working or they haven't updated for a while, there seems to be a shutdown that they don't think about um, updating the app. So it's a really good thing to um, encourage these students to uh, update their app frequently. Also with editing, um, there's not much editing that can be done with uh, your flip, uh, Flipgrid video response. You can tweak things at the beginning and the end, but there's nothing to be done in the uh, middle of the video. However, like I said earlier, it does allow you to pause and gather your thoughts before you go on and you can record as, as, as many times until you're comfortable with your response. Uh, just a few last things on the next slide to finish up with Flipgrid. When you do create your uh, Flipgrid account. Uh, you'll create a dashboard or a home page and when you access, access that there's a discovery library which gives you access to ways educators around the world have been using Flipgrid in their classrooms. There's also a program called Grid Pals that if you aren't currently using Flipgrid or you are, you might want to make sure that you're searchable on your dashboard because it allows you to connect with educators around the world. And as language teachers, what a great opportunity for us to try to establish a connection with the classroom in one of the countries uh, that speaks the target language that we're teaching in our class. Um, I personally have not had success with this yet, but I think it's a really exciting um, option that they uh, have on Flipgrid now. And again, uh, this just started, I think, um, in J July or August of this year. I put some links here for additional resources. There's a monthly newsletter that Flipgrid sends out. And when you do um, set up your Flipgrid account, there's tons of educators guides. Uh, the link on the slide is for the main educators guide. I think one of my colleagues tonight, Heidi's going to talk a little bit more about Flipgrid with some app smashing with Adobe Spark. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. I know that there's some questions here at the bottom of the chat room. So thank you for your time and attention. Um, for the sake of time, Megan, do you want to answer the questions in the chat while I talk yeah, about I can do that. Okay, perfect. Um, because I do want to cover all these tools and, and I know the program was a little ambitious. I love seeing those questions. These are really great questions. So if you're interested in, uh, the questions just monitor the chat and uh, if you want to hear a little bit about VoiceThread, I am going to give you an overview and double check that I'm not muted. I've done this before and took a very long time to realize. Um, but you can all hear me, right? Okay. Um, so, um, as I mentioned before, I, uh, Amanda was going to present on VoiceThread and I asked Amanda because she is, uh, she went through the training, uh, I forgot what it's called, but um, she knows VoiceThread in and out. But I've been working with VoiceThread for almost 10 years now. And um, I'm just going to give you a, a brief overview of what it does. Um, I'll say upfront that the biggest, um, drawback is that it's not free I actually got cut off here but one educator and 50 students accounts is $79 per year um, the best way really to use voice thread is to try to get your school to get a site license um, and voice thread is really a tool that can be used not just by foreign language teachers it can really be used by all the other departments and so if you can get together with some of your colleagues and, and make a case for getting a site license uh, a lot of schools are doing this now um, even for a single educator I think it's a great tool and unfortunately not all the tools that we use are always free um, we do focus on tools that are free in the program as much as we can um, and I um, but I really like VoiceThread I've been working with it for years what I like about it is that it's passworded. And so once you are behind your voice thread wall, only you and your students can see the work. Um, 
In VoiceThread, students and teachers can really upload any media and upload comments on this media. So you can upload a video of yourself or another video that you might have, or students can upload a photo or you can upload a photo. And then you and your students can record audio comments, video comments, or text comments on these photos. And I'll show you exactly what it looks like here in a minute. There's also a doodle tool that allows you to write on the slide as you present. Um, and um, students also have the ability to reply to each other's comments. So all in all, um, it's a really great tool. You can even, as a teacher, you can moderate the comments. Um, so I really like it. And I'm just going to go to VoiceThread. I'm not, um, I unfortunately don't have student examples because I didn't have time to get permission. Um, I see in the chat that there is a request to go into present mode, and the reason why I can't is that otherwise I can't see the chat and I can't see the presenters or the questions. It just hides all of that, so I need to stay in this format. I know it's not great, but um, if, if you can bear with me uh, on this. So this is VoiceThread. Uh, CU Boulder has a site license, so if you take certificate courses, you, can, you actually have your own site license. And you can play with it and, and see how you like it and you know really decide for yourself. So once you're logged in, you go to create and then you can drop um, anything. So here I have a photo, but it could be a video. Um, uh, for example, I don't know, something that will get students talking. So here you have a photo of bullfighting, but I could also um, here under add media, I could add a photo uh, or I could take a photo of myself right here on the spot or I could record a video comment. And as soon as the photo is done processing and hopefully it's not going to take too long because I'm running out of things to say in the meantime, thank you. Joe. <laughs> uh, you can go to comment. And here's your photo, and here you can't see it very well, but this is the commenting option. So I can leave an audio comment or a video comment. I can even call in a comment, or I can leave a text comment. So for me here, I could leave a prompt for my students and say, you know, what do you think of bullfighting? And I know it's, it's a, controversial, a controversial topic. Um, we are presenting today tools that are mostly uh, asynchronous, and this is not meant to replace in-class discussions, but I, for topics like this one, where students can get really emotionally, emotionally involved, it's really hard for them to, for example, have a debate on the spot. I mean, the debate runs out quickly, they run out of arguments. So when you do kind of a slow down debate on voice thread, students can really build their arguments and answer to each other's arguments. Think about it, think about what they want to say, and you can absolutely, absolutely have a follow-up conversation in class. So that's VoiceThread. Here, um, you could have 70 or 100 photos if you wanted to. Depending on the level of permission that you give your students, they can also upload their own photo. And so in terms of the types of projects that you can do with VoiceThread, um, there are so many. Um, and, but you can do, for example, interpersonal assignments where you're doing a job interview between you and a student or between two students. You can do presentational activities where students present on the topic of their choice. Um, they can respond to each other's, uh, I'm sorry, they can leave comments on each other's presentation, which serves also as an interpretive assignment. Uh, and you can moderate those comments or you can hide all those comments. So you have a lot of control. VoiceThread comes with a lot of um, teacher control. Um, going back here, when you're done setting up your assignment, you simply go to share and you can share it with your class or you know, a group of students um, going back here. Um, another way that I've seen and another way that I've used VoiceThread is to create flipped lessons where I've created a lesson in PowerPoint and then I recorded a voiceover narration over uh, the presentation. What I like about this is that if you're truly flipping your classroom, you can have question slides where students have to answer the slide just for you to check that they've actually watched it. Uh, or do a simple exercise. And like I said, uh, you can prevent the students from seeing each other's answers. So it would be a quick way to check that they've done the assignment. Um, let's see. Um, another way that I've used it in a fully online course a few years ago was that I uploaded two commercials um, for road safety. 
And these two commercials were really easy, really interesting because the first commercial was very violent. It was a French commercial and they, they just, they tried to shock viewers. And the second commercial was just very artistic and very beautiful, but, um, and so two very different approaches. And I was asking my students to kind of compare and discuss what's most effective in their views. So lots of things you can do, uh, especially if you're teaching online in a blended context and or even if you're flipping your classroom. Um, let's see. What I like about it, it's passworded, I don't have to worry. Nobody knows what's going on behind this wall. Um, you know, my students' privacy is preserved. It's very user-friendly. Um, there's a built-in media library so that students can go and find images. Um, you, you can create groups. What I don't like about it is that it's not free. Uh, and also, if you have links in your media, they don't work. So that's suboptimal. But other than that, that is VoiceThread. It's a very powerful tool. Um, and I'm going to take a look at um, the questions. Does VoiceThread has a set licensing fee or is it structure based on? So it, um, VoiceThread has a bunch of licenses. It has the single educator license. It has a whole site license. Um, it, it has different pricing structures based on uh, where you teach, how many students you have. And so, um, let's see, I'm sure their pricing um, is available. And also you can use it for free. It's limited, uh, but you see there's a single educator license. No, you can't see it, but I'm, uh, I'm looking at the pricing structure and um, the K-12 school license is 450 for 350 students. There's also a district license option. So there's also a five pack option and that's actually new for $3. So really you need to explore and decide for yourself, but you can go and create up to three voice threads for free and decide whether, you know, this is a tool that you want to acquire. So, um, I, if you have more questions, go ahead and ask in the chat. And Heidi, I'm going to unmute you and I'm going to mute myself. All right. Hi, everybody. I am Heidi Trude. I am a French teacher at Skyline High School in Front Royal, Virginia. This is my 11th year teaching, and I am the 2019 Actual Language Teacher of the Year finalist. And today I'll be presenting Adobe Spark to you all. And I absolutely love Adobe Spark. One reason I love it. It is free. So on the next slide, we're gonna look at some of the reasons of what is Adobe Spark and how it works. So Adobe Spark is actually, there are three components to it. There is Adobe Spark Video, Adobe Spark Post, and Adobe Spark Pages. For today, we're gonna focus on Adobe Spark Video, but just to give you an overview of Post and Pages, because it's probably a tool you would want to use in your classroom as well, though posts and pages do not focus on oral proficiency. Adobe Spark Post is used for creating graphics, so if you want to make infographics, posters, anything like that, it's an awesome free tool to use. Adobe Spark Pages could be used to make a blog, a website, a scrolling newsletter, anything of that sort. Now, Adobe Spark Video, is probably my favorite video creation tool, and I use it for lots of oral presentations in my classroom with my students, as it allows me and the students to create animated videos that incorporate text, images, music, and narration. You can also include video clips into your Adobe Spark videos as well. It's a cloud-based tool. It works on all devices, pretty much, with the exception of on mobile, it does not work unless you have an iOS device. And there is now an educator version that is available and it does have some more options than the regular version does. So for that, to activate the educator version, you have to have your instructional technology coordinator contact Adobe and they then authorize the license, the educator license to you. But the free version works just fine. I've had no issues and neither have the students being able to access anything. It's absolutely wonderful. In the screenshot down at the bottom, you see what the home page looks like if you're on Spark itself. And it shows that's actually a shot of my Adobe Spark 
page where you have all your projects are stored in one space. So it's very easy for the students. They don't have to go searching anywhere. Everything is there. And you simply hit the blue plus button at the top of the screen. And it'll be like, what do you want to create today? And you can choose, do you want to post a page or a video? And it's absolutely amazing how simple it is for the students to use this tool. So on the next slide, we'll look at how I use this in my classroom. And like I said, I use this a lot for digital storytelling projects and presentational topics. So I like to use a lot of digital storytelling where I give the students a prompt to start and then they create a story. They're telling, and students, we know, they love to create stories. They love to talk about themselves or others. So we've done projects where in my classes they had a topic, it was a dark and stormy night. That's all I give them and then it's up to them to create the rest of the story and then they illustrate it within Spark where they're pulling in images, they're pulling in the music that accompanies it. They do their voice narration in it and they have the text. So you have a complete audio visual presentation of their work. We've done, when I was young, using the Passe Composé Imparfait, describing what I, what I used to be like, similar to what Megan had mentioned. We've done one where I do a capstone in level one where they describe themselves, basically incorporating all the skills that we've learned in French one. So it's a really great way for the students to speak about themselves, get that oral practice in, and to create a really good looking final product. Another way I like to incorporate Adobe Spark into my classroom is through what is called app smashing. And when you app smash, that is basically when you're taking one or more tools and you're putting them together to create a more functional tool. So what I do is I have my students create their projects in Adobe Spark, we then download the Spark video, and then we upload it into Flipgrid. This allows all the students to view each other's projects very easily and also creates that dialogue where they can now comment on each other's presentations, ask follow-up questions, etc. And another way I use it is we collaborate with a partner school in France and my students and the students in France can share their videos back and forth that way. And then we have that open dialogue going between each other. So it's a very easy way to do that. And it's very easy in Adobe Spark to just download your videos. So you can see the image at the bottom shows you what your page would look like when you're creating a video. And it's very simple, you have a simple slide, you have your layouts, all your tools there on the right hand side for you to choose from. And then you just work slide by slide, adding in either an image, adding the narration with your audio, the red button, and then very simple. So to see what an example looks like, we'll look at one of my students' examples from It Was a Dark and Stormy Night. So this is done by a French two student. Of time, I'm gonna go to the other example. Yeah. If you want to know, the no problem, story, you're gonna have to listen to it. It's really good, it's and this is the French one project, their end of the year project. All right, same thing here. Um, I've had multiple requests to go into present mode, so I'm going to give it a shot, okay? I'm, I might not be able to keep it because it prevents me from controlling other things. But um, All right, go ahead, Heidi. Okay, so if we go to the next slide, I'll show you guys some of why I like voice thread even more. Not voice thread, wow, Adobe Spark. Sorry about that, guys. So the main reason I like it, it is free. It is very user-friendly. Like when I first started using this with my students, 
I didn't even have to teach them how to use it. They literally got on it. Spark provides you with a one minute tutorial and the kids just watch that one minute little clip and they're like, we got this. This is easy. And they have actually started using it in their other classes and have got other teachers to use this with them as a form of a presentation. It's very intuitive. And it also, what I like with it as well, it has images, music, and the icons that are already in there that are free to use. So you don't have to worry about the students breaking any copyright issues. They just search right within the image bank and Adobe Spark pulls up the images that are free use. The music is there as well. And if they don't want to use an actual image, it has all kind of icons they can use that represent almost anything is in there. At the very end of their presentations, I also like it because it's teaching them to be good digital citizens. It creates the credit slide for them and it credits every single image they use in their presentation. Also credits if they use music and if the students pull in other images, they have that option to add in their own credits in there. And when they use their own pictures like my student did in the last example, it's really cute. The kids usually end up crediting like mom and dad for thanks mom for taking these photos of me when I was a baby and they have a lot of fun with that part. Editing is very, very simple in Spark. It's literally you have just a couple tools that you can click, super easy. And it's also easy for the students to share their work. They can easily share the link with me or they can download it. And what I've started doing, because we encountered some issues at the start of the school year where the links weren't working when they'd share them with me, so I just have the students now, we do the download, the, we download their videos and then they upload them to Flipgrid. So then I have everyone's video in one spot and I'm not searching for this student's email that they sent me with the link and this student's email. And it's just a whole lot easier to do the download and it's very easy. The only con that I could come up with is that it is only available on mobile for iOS. And now actually I just thought of another con and it's more, it's just a reminder to the students that when you're recording, you actually, like some tools, you hit the button to record and then you let go of it. With Spark, you have to continuously hold down the recording button. So it's just a matter of training the students to hold down the button till you're done recording, then let go. Because sometimes they'll kind of be like, we recorded this, we said it, but there's nothing there. And then I ask them, did you hold the button? No. Okay, that's your problem. So that's just one thing, but that's a matter of just teaching the students how to use it properly. Heidi, but over, yeah. Um, I just want to clarify, um, it, the app is only available on iOS, but you can yes. access the website from any computer. Yes, website works on any browser without a problem. And it's just the mobile app on your phone only works on iOS. There's no, there's supposedly an Android app in the making, but I don't know when that becomes available. So if we go to the next slide, I just am going to leave you all with a few resources. So I have linked several resources here. So if you're interested more on digital storytelling and how you can use that in your classroom, I have links to my slide deck there as well as a webinar on it. I also have a link to just specifically how to use Adobe Spark in the World Language Classroom, as well as Adobe Spark has a book that's just come out on 40 ways how to inject creativity into your classroom using Spark. There are some of those 40 activities that's focused specifically on the language classroom, though I found some of the other ones are, you can modify them very, very easily to use in the language classroom. So I just wanna leave that with you all. And if you have any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat and I am more than happy to answer those. You can also connect with me via email, which is on the screen or via Twitter, which is up there as well. So if you have any questions, go ahead and throw those in the chat and I will turn it over to the next presenter. All right, thank you so much, Heidi. Our next presenter is Stephen. I just need to find him down the list. There you are and unmute Stephen. All right, hi Stephen, how are you? I'm doing fine, thank you, Edrich. Hi everyone. I'm Stephen Hale, and I'm an English teacher in Sendai City in Northeast Japan. Today, I'd like to introduce you to the online tool called Linked, which can be found at linked.com. As you can see from the screenshot, the website page is both inviting and simple. 
a nice match for this equally inviting and simple to use tool. The pricing varies from free to $14 a month or more. For free, a teacher can create 10 different activities for up to 20 students. For $14 a month, the teacher can create unlimited numbers of activities for up to 200 students. And uh, the pricing for an entire school requires some cons consultation with the webmaster. In the next slide, so what can you do with linked? Well, linked allows you to do three things very easily. First, you can create a variety of speaking assignments and assessments. Second, you can deliver those assignments to students through a link on your LMS or sent directly through email, email or texting. And third, once the assignments are finished and submitted, link allows you to review student work and provide individualized feedback from the website. Let me talk about each of these three basic tasks, starting with the image on the right. Here you can see the basic template for creating any kind of assignment. Linked, offer, linked offers a drag and drop interface in which you can create uh, directions and questions by using the content icons for either voice, text, video, images, and or MP3 recordings. Using the white space as a template, for example, you can simply click on my assignments, the text box that is, uh, write the name of your assignment, and then drag and drop whichever the media formats you want to use into the space below. Next, for the students' responses, you can choose to have uh, students either write or speak their responses by dragging and dropping one of the prompt icons so that it automatically connects with the question icon. It's very simple. In the next slide, I have an example of an ordinary assignment focusing on English comparative adjective forms. Here I show three examples of 10 different questions from the assignment. And this is what a student would see. In the first question form in the upper left image, the student would click on the blue icon, listen to my questions, question as many times as she wants, then click on the connecting 10 icon and record her answer. The student can re-listen to her answer, delete it, and retry her answer as many times as she pleases. The second question in the lower left image simply reverses the structure of the question so that the student listens to an answer and then must formulate a question which would elicit that answer. Next on the top right, you can see another kind of question using an image. Here the student must analyze the image and then either make a statement describing some parts of it using the comparative adjective form or pose an appropriate question about what they see. Finally, at the end of the assignment, there's a submit button. When the student clicks that button, she will be asked to write her email address in a box and then send that to the teacher. If any questions were left unanswered, however, Linked will prompt the student to finish the entire activity first before, her, before allowing her to fully submit the assignment. Uh, I, I like that function. The next slide shows a dashboard view in the account. This is where the teacher receives assignments and can check the student's work simply by opening a file, clicking on the red, I, the red recording icons on the left and listening to them. The teacher can then respond uh, 
can choose to respond with text, voice, or a thumbs up icon to the right. When the response is oral, the teacher can also listen, re-listen to the feedback and erase and redo it if necessary. It's pretty well organized. Oh, and it's here that the student's email address becomes important since this is how a link to the teacher's assessment is sent back to the student. In the next slide, with the example number two, I show an archive of activities in something that I call the TOEFL IBT Speaking Practicum. This is part of a 10-day pr program to help students prepare for the TOEFL IBT. In this project, students watch a video tutorial on one of the six different kinds of questions on the TOEFL speaking section. Then they go to link.com to practice several examples of that specific kind of question. At its most complex, uh, the TOEFL questions have an integrated task requiring academic uh, listening, note-taking, uh, reading, uh, and speaking skills in a limited amount of time. It's a little complicated, but I found that the link tool allowed me to simulate all of the test question forms almost flawlessly and provide complete mock tests. The only thing that was lacking was a timer mechanism to make the text appear or disappear. But otherwise, it was just fine. In the next slide, a few words on likes and dislikes. I really like the tutorials that link.com provides its new users. There are three four minute videos which clearly explain how to use the tool. I also like the tool itself uh, because it is quite user friendly, not only from a teacher's point of view, but also from a student's point of view. That is, it's very intuitive in terms of how, how it works and it's, it's easy to remember. Finally, I really like how, even though this is a great tool for oral proficiency, uh, it can also be used for reading and writing assignments and assessments. Now, as for dislikes, uh, I'm not too thrilled about the pricing of the tool, especially when you have to pay for 12, mon 12 months upfront or a little extra like $18 a month for a monthly installment plan. Also, there's no save as a function, which allows you to take already created activities and convert or tweak them in some way to create slightly different or improved activities. Still, the ease with which you can use linked makes uh, that kind of a moot point. Next slide, please. Finally, I encourage everyone to spend 10 or 15 minutes with the tutorials and then another 10 or 15 minutes experimenting with the free version. I think my first assignment took me about 25 minutes to make and I was quite happy with the results. Thank you, Stephen. You're welcome. I'll address any questions uh, using the chat. Great. Thank you everyone for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, and yes, please, if you can answer the questions in the chat. Um, and thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I know it's Friday for you, but it's still Thursday for us. <laughs> That's fun. All right, I am muting Stephen and unmuting Eve, our last presenter today. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. All right, I'm presenting on extempore. Um, uh, let's see, I'm Eve Leons, and I specialize in teaching students with learning differences, and I teach at Lamar College located in southern Vermont. 
And Landmark is fairly unique. Uh, we work exclusively with students who have learning differences. So I have in my classroom um, always students with dyslexia, students with ADHD, and at this point, perhaps 30% of my students are on the spectrum. So it's a fairly unique environment. And a lot of my students are the ones that were uh, told that they sh shouldn't learn a language because they needed to spend more time working on core skills. So I have a lot of beginner level speakers, um, although I'll also have, have advanced level speakers. So it's a real mix. So um, focusing on extempore, here's what you see when you uh, go to the web page. You'll see that um, the web address is extemporeapp.com. And the pricing model has two different forms. One is an institutional model uh, for $8.99 per student per semester and a student paid model. And that price is covered up, so I can't see what the price is. Ed Beach? Can you not see the prices? Mm, no. Hold on. Let me minimize what's going on over here. We might need to move. Oh, there we go. Okay, great. Okay, so the students pay $9.99 per class. And on the next slide. All right, so this chunk of information essentially I've gotten directly from Extempore. You'll also see that there's a YouTube link here, and then that again, it takes you to an uh, explanation video that Extempore has created. All right, so this is essentially how uh, Extempore talks about itself. So um, they believe that it eliminates the need for a language lab for speaking and listening practice. Students can work on their computers or mobile devices. And where this product is unique is that they focus on integrating various things like timing parameters to ensure spontaneous student responses. Instructors obtain and assess authentic speech without having to schedule face-to-face -face time with each individual student. Student responses are easy to grade. Uh, instructors can grade using a customizable rubric and give text and audio feedback. Uh, you can also choose not to use a rubric. If you use this program consistently, it essentially automatically creates a student speaking portfolio, which you can have as a reference. And the platform can be used for formal assessments as well as low stakes activities, both in and outside of the classroom. Next slide. All right, so what's interesting is that I sort of came at my use with Extempore from sort of a side angle. Uh, I was teaching novice level students and I was essentially looking for a way to scaffold the practice of a very long structured conversation dialogue. And I looked around and Extempore seemed to be the best tool for the job. So I was using it as a practice tool and through the use of this tool, I was able to give students structured practice and feedback on each question prior to a face-to-face -face conversation assessment with each student. Uh, the face-to-face -face conversation that I did with them was structured, it followed what I had, the way that I had had them practice in extempore and also unstructured using authentic prompts. What I liked about Extempore was that it was able to handle the input of a large number of questions in a way that was still easy for students to manage. The technology behind the program worked. Students didn't have any difficulty with the recordings, and so they were pleased about that. There wasn't anything glitchy about the program. Next slide. All right, so this is how you uh, create a prompt as a teacher. So the first thing that you do is obviously you name your assessment. Uh, there's a start time, the due time, you decide how students are going to respond, whether that's a video response or an audio response. You can describe it, you can 
decide uh, how you're publishing the grades and whether or not you're going to give a numeric score. So on mine, I actually chose not to, although I clicked yes so that um, you could see more of the parameters. Um, you can set how much time they have to review, how much time do they respond, and whether or not they can auto record. And then this is how you create the rubric. Um, but you can see how this is, program is very good if you actually do want to create a very structured testing type situation. Next slide. All right, so when you're creating an individual question, it looks as simple as this. So as the instructor, I can add text and then I can choose to upload a file or a video or audio. What you can't do is pick more than one of these. Uh, when you uh, have completed the activity and students are actually doing it, this is what it looks like on their end. So you can see that in this particular prompt, I've given them text and I've given them a sound file. And so they can click on this and they can hear uh, this written language spoken. And then uh, they answer simply by clicking on start an audio attempt. This could also be a video record, but in this case it was audio. Next slide. All right. Um, so, what I loved about the program was they actually have truly phenomenal customer service. The technology that's behind the program is really solid. So it's HTML5 versus Flash, which I've had a lot of difficulty with. Um, and they claim to have the latest recording technologies. Uh, it's very easy to edit if I want to approve it on activity and they just released Canvas integration. So I haven't tried it, but um, that's something that's available. Oh, and one thing that I think I skipped uh, on the last slide was it's very easy to give student feedback. And I can do that in writing, by voice, by video. Uh, what I don't, didn't love as much were that if I add a link to a prompt, uh, that the links aren't hot. Students would have to copy paste them and use them outside of the program. The tool itself ha very much has an assessment feel versus a skill building or conversation practice feel. Um, and maybe with you know, further use of the program, I could find ways to make it seem, you know, a little more fuzzy, I guess. Um, I also thought uh, it would be nice if you could add more than one prompt. For example, again, as I mentioned, um, you could have a file or a video or an audio, and I would like to be able to choose more than one of those. And then my last thought was um, that while the teacher can add writing to a prompt, there's no way for students uh, to use writing in their response. So that's a feature that I would add if I could. Next slide. Okay. Um, all right, so the program is designed to be able to capture extemporaneous speech, but it can be used in a variety of ways. So I chose the program for its ability to give structured speaking practice and again, very structured feedback on a lengthy speaking task. Uh, the program's perhaps better suited to simple prompts. Um, so for example, if I had put in a YouTube video and then had students respond to that, or a simple question like, tell me about your weekend or tell me about your coming, upcoming vacation, and then students could simply respond to that. You know, that would have worked in a way that was cleaner, um, but it was able to handle the task that I threw at it, uh, which was wonderful. And if you'd like additional examples of activities, I pulled this link from their website, and they have lots of great ideas there. So I encourage you to check out the program. It worked great for me. Right. And if you have any questions, I'll answer those in the chat. Yes. So, uh, and let's see. Um, 
So this was our last presenter, uh, and we uh, actually went just five minutes over our time, which is really great timing. Uh, if you have any questions for the presenters, uh, you are welcome to email them. I think most of them have their email addresses on the slides, and if you guys didn't put your email address, maybe go ahead and add it so that you can email the presenters directly. Uh, if you have any questions about the program, you're welcome to ask me right now. Um, I'm just going to uh, um, I'm, I'm just going to go to um, uh, so if you want to unmute yourselves right now, you can. Um, thank you very much for attending this webinar. If you have any questions about the program, you're also welcome to email any of our presenters. Uh, some of them are done with the program. Uh, like Heidi is done, but as Ethan is taking classes and Megan is still taking classes. And, um, so you're welcome to ask them about their experience with the program and, and you know, get their answers, unfiltered answers directly. If you have any questions about the requirements, how to sign up, things like that, go ahead and email me. We're a small program, so chances are uh, whatever question you have, I will be the one providing the answer. So thank you very much, um, Stephen and Heidi and uh, Eve, and where did Megan go? I've lost Megan, but Megan, you can unmute yourself if you want and uh, just say your goodbyes. There you go. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we, uh, we will have another, four more webinars this spring. The other webinars are what I call showcase webinars where students are presenting projects they've developed in the program. And so I'm uh, working on the next one. Uh, if you've attended this webinar, you've been added to our mailing list. You will get our next email about the courses, the webinars, the events. If you don't want to stay on the list, you're welcome to just remove yourself. Uh, you will not be re-added. And if you, um, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or simply check the website to see what is coming up on the schedule. So thank you very much, and you all have a great night. Thank you. Stop sharing my screen. All right, great attendance. Um, okay, merci beaucoup. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you. Very nice. Next time we do a webinar, I'll ask everybody to just let me know where you guys are located, just for fun. Um, all right, I'm leaving the meeting now. You guys have a great night. Uh, I'll, Good night. I'll, Good night. The recording. Good night. I'll email everybody the recording tomorrow afternoon. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>